the basic flow of today's presentation will be um, a little bit of background about BookNet Canada, a little bit of background about the book supply chain in Canada and how it works, and then uh, a little more time on how BookNet's products and services fit into the supply chain and the book ecosystem here in Canada and international. And then as Alina mentioned, hopefully we'll have some uh, time for questions at the end. If we run out of time, uh, please uh, feel free to contact us in uh, a lot of our different channels which we'll post here and uh, we'll do our best to answer the questions. So um, with that, uh, let me get started. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, I think we'll start with a little bit of uh, history of BookNet. So uh, BookNet Canada is a trade association in effect where industry run not for profit not for profit we were formed in 2002 by the canadian book industry in partnership with the government of canada through uh, the department of heritage of canada book fund so we're kind of a private public partnership and uh, we uh, focus primarily on uh, canadian culture uh, what booknet has done since we were founded is design and develop made in canada solutions that address difficulties facing Canadian publishers, retailers, libraries, and other stakeholders in the supply chain. These solutions are specific to meet the demands of Canadians' unique book selling market where a small population is condensed across a very large geographical area. I didn't talk a map of Canada up here, but for those, for those of you joining us from outside Canada, it's a big country. Um, we are, as I said, a trade association. We're cross-sector. Um, our primary stakeholder groups are publishers, distributors, libraries, wholesalers, and retailers. So we work on building consensus by working with trade associations representing Canadian-owned publishers, multinational publishers, distributors, retailers, and libraries. All of these, all of these groups direct what BookNet is working on and continue to direct us to this day. So we work on cross-sector initiatives. Um, we focus on a bunch of different areas. Uh, some of these projects you may recommend, recommend um, really our kind of base mandate is to help the Canadian industry adapt to technological change. We do that by building tools and services for use by multiple players in the supply chain. We also help publishers via education through the adoption and development of international standards. I'm going to touch on many of these projects today, but not all of them. Um, there's lots of information on our website about stuff I don't touch, but uh, most of these uh, I will touch on briefly today. So just as a, a, a little kind of, I guess, timeline, uh, as I mentioned already, we've been around since about 2002, and we were born out of an initiative that the, uh, that the industry and government got together and decided that there should be an organization like BookNet to address a bunch of the issues we're going to talk about today. So um, in the 15 or so years that we've been around, 16 years, 15 years, um, we've continued to launch new initiatives, new services, and new products at a fairly rapid pace. Um, for those of you who don't know BookNet very well, um, we're staffed now of about 15 or 16 people. Um, most of the stuff we do is done right here in-house. Most of the uh, services that we offer, um, we build and run ourselves, and uh, by proxy, they're owned uh, by the industry. So um, Canada's a little unique in that, and a lot of the services that we're going to talk about today are run for profit in other territories. I'm also going to spend some time today um, talking about data and, uh, and research. It's fundamental to everything BookNet does. Um, we have a, a history and a, and a strong belief in data as a driver. So we use data in a lot of our products. Um, we also teach about data analytics and the use of data in business processes um, across the industry. Uh, here in Canada and abroad. So some of the data I'm going to be touching on is sales data. That's data, POS data, we sometimes call that. It's point of sale data, web analytics data, metadata, ethnographic data, consumer data, process data, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we offer products and services that manage this data, but we also um, look at the data ourselves to see what's going on uh, in the industry and release that back uh, to back in the, in the form of products or in research reports and, and things like that. So I'm going to bounce around a bit today um, and give some context to the different types of data we see and some of the research we do. Um, but first, I'm going to start with uh, with, this, with the supply chain. Um, so BookNet Canada's mandate is, uh, is, to te is te around technology, as I mentioned. Um, technology, innovation, and supply chain efficiency in the book industry. Um, 
That's what we're dedicated to. That's pretty much underlies everything we do. It's why the Global Mail called us the Book Industry Supply Chain Nerve Center. Um, and it's uh, why we spend so much time with data and all the stuff that goes along in the supply chain. So stepping back for a second, what is the supply chain? Um, so the supply chain, I hope many of you know, the supply chain is the broad network of people, companies, systems, information, technologies, and resources that are dedicated to moving products and services from the suppliers to the consumer. Sometimes we call, sometimes we call these, we call the supply chain a demand change. Demand chain is really the same thing. Uh, the demand chain focuses a little bit more on the consumer side. And so we, we tend to use those two terms interchangeably. It also be the value chain, um, all of those kinds of things. What it's really talking about is the steps and processes involved in moving um, in our in our parlance, moving the books from uh, the author or the publisher all the way to the end consumer or end reader. So we spent a lot of time talking about this. Uh, when supply chains are mismanaged, companies, industries, and the consumers who require the products suffer. They can't find things, they can't get them, they can't buy them. These are all problems that uh, we want to uh, address and, and, and make, make better. Um, in the book industry, like in many other uh, verticals or in many other products, um, there are really multiple supply chains. We're not talking about just one supply chain here. Um, in our industry, in the book industry, there are supply chains based on format. I'm going to touch a little bit on that today. By that, I mean there's really a, a supply chain for print books and a supply chain for digital items. There's also supply, different supply chains based on channels. And by that, I mean the, the actors or the processors in a supply chain for selling online could be different from those selling uh, to physical stores or even in the types of physical stores you're working with. So we're talking about multiple supply chains. And another um, somewhat unique issue for Canada is that we actually have two supply chains broken down uh, on our international language barriers too. So um, mostly what I'm going to touch on today, in fact all of what I'm going to touch on today, is really the English language supply chain. So in Canada we have two, two primary languages, we have English and French, and the supply chains in effect are broken across those two language barriers too. Now we do work together um, between the two different supply chains, but they are somewhat unique. And so I'd be remiss in not mentioning that we have a sister organization in Quebec, uh, BKLF, who offers similar services and provides a similar role for the French language subject, uh, French language supply chain. And Canada, or sorry, BookNet and BKLF work very, very closely together uh, on things like standards and even on some of our products and services, but they are somewhat unique. Where Canada's supply chain tends to align with the US or North-South, uh, the Quebec the French language supply chain tends, tends to align a little bit more with uh, East West and France, and that seems to be a logical, uh, a logical uh, direction for it to move. But there, there's some similarities, and, and a lot of the steps and processes are going to be the same, but the actors could be a little bit different. So that's what the supply chain is. What does that actually look like uh, in the book industry? Well, I'm here to show you. So uh, in the print book market, it looks something like this. So this isn't a, looks complicated, but it's actually a simplified view of the book supply chain for print books in Canada. So the blue, the blue steps tend to be publisher uh, initiated steps in our market. The green steps tend to be distributor uh, steps or processes, and the orangish color tends to be the retailer part of the supply chain. So this is really the traditional book supply chain. And like everything in our industry, it's undergoing change. So most of these steps or links are still present in the current supply chain, but the actors that perform these particular roles have become more muddy. We have retailers acting as publishers and publishers acting as retailers, distributors acting as publishers, distributors acting as retailers, wholesalers are in here. And, and so the steps and processes are pretty much the same, but the actors serving in those particular roles are in effect changing. And when we look way out at the side there, the editorial box, you'll notice there's one actor, there's one primary person, primary step or actor missing from this diagram, and that's the author. And we tend to, we being book that tends to not touch too much on the author, but they are incredibly important, obviously, to everything we do. And uh, I've just, we've just left them off the side here because a lot of what we're talking about is the production and distribution of content. It's not necessarily the authoring of content, but 
some of the products and services that we offer do go back to the author step as well. So but looking at these particular steps, we're going to touch on some of the products and services that impact on each of these different areas. Um, off to the side there, you'll see returns. <laughs> returns uh, is per pervasive in our print book industry in Canada and in North America and in other markets as well. Um, we work in effect like a consignment-based industry where books are sold to retailers and then retailers, if they don't sell them, can return them for their, in effect, full value back. So returns are an important part of the supply chain here. Um, all of the other steps, uh, you could take each one of those steps and explode them out into minute detail of all the sub-steps that go on in them, but I've kept it relatively simple here, uh, just so we understand what we're talking about. Customer service is hugely important across all of these areas, and a lot of this is what we would consider to be business to business. We're not talking about, other than a few steps in the retailer part of the supply chain, we're not talking about selling directly to consumers, although publishers are now doing that as well, and others. So this is the print book supply chain. Um, we can also look, as I mentioned, that there's multiple supply chains, and that there's, a, in effect, a little bit different supply chain for uh, the digital market. Returns disappears in the uh, digital market, obviously because it's digital books. So other than consumers perhaps returning books to retailers, there isn't that same, uh, there, there are not those same steps in the, in the digital supply chain that have to encompass the return of the consignment-based books back to, um, back to the publisher and distributor warehouses. So what we have here is a little bit of a streamlined uh, supply chain for digital. Um, and here, similar colors mean similar things. Blue is still the publisher. Um, green, in this case, is a dam, a digital asset manager, probably. And it may be that the publisher is acting as their own dam, or they may be using a third-party service like eBound here in Canada. And then the orange, in this case, is an e-tailer, or a Kobo or an Amazon. Um, obviously, in the orange steps, customer service is huge, uh, in our, even more so maybe in, in uh, the digital market than it is in the print book market. But many of the steps are still the same. And this is one of the challenges when we're talking to consumers or talking publicly, is that um, just because we've moved to digital, the supply chain hasn't disappeared. It's just changed a little bit, and a lot of the steps are still there. You still need the same amount of editorial, and you still need perhaps the same amount of sales and marketing, and there's still distribution, and there's still customer service, maybe more customer service. And while there's no ordering and returns, there's still reporting and all the infrastructure that needs to be built to move files around and, and, and financial information about the sales that are happening. So it's, a, it's a, just a different supply chain, but it's still, you know, it's still very quite complicated and involves a lot of moving pieces. So those are only two supply chains, and I, there could be a separate one for online, as I mentioned. Um, and there may be other ones for uh, different languages. So, but the steps across many of the supply chains would be very, very similar. So that's a pretty brief, brief overview of the supply chain, but I'm going to touch on a lot more of those steps as we go through some of the products and services we offer. So back to BookNet for a second. So why is BookNet, you know, why do we exist and why are we fixated on improving the supply chain? Well, when you improve the supply chain, you take control of the means of production and to a certain degree, the allocation of labor and effort. What we are interested in doing is increasing or decreasing the, the friction involved in doing business across the supply chain. So BookNet is focusing on how do we take cost out of the system? So what does that mean for the players in the supply chain? Well, when we look at suppliers, and a lot of these, I've got some bullet points here, but a lot of these different uh, points hold true across different different actors in the supply chain. So suppliers, obviously, by focusing on the supply chain, supply chain, we can look at taking out cost reductions. We can look at doing standardization, which helps in communication across the supply chain. We can improve visibility, which also helps with communication across the supply chain, and many other, other things. And remember, suppliers may be distributors, they may be wholesalers, or they may be publishers, and in some cases, they can be authors especially in the self-published realm. When we talk about retailers, um, we're talking about increased efficiencies, we're talking about improved customer service, and those things overlap between retailers and suppliers for sure, um, on both sides of the case. And so when we look collectively across all the supply chain, we're looking at these business benefits. Supply chain improvements are largely about cost reduction and resource allocation. 
Because of BookNet's own work over the years, publishing the booksellers are more efficient in the buying of books, the processing of orders, shipping, and receiving. So, you know, there are lots of benefit, business benefits. These are a few of them. We're also looking at operational benefits. Um, it becomes easier to provide customer service, simpler to source purchase than books, easier to promote books, all of the stuff that moving um, data around can help with, or moving information around can help with, or collaborating and communicating can help with. You know, one of the one of the things that we, have, I guess, that we have a rant on, you guys have having a personal rant, is that we are completely against the re-seeing of data. No one should have to type in data in this day and age, um, aside from maybe an ISDN. Um, in the book industry, all of the data should be linked together and following an efficient way. It doesn't yet, but that's our ultimate goal, and it's one of the things we're always looking to improve. Is if someone re-seeing data, it's usually an opportunity for an operational improvement in that case. Um, we're funded by the Department of Canadian Heritage from, their, uh, from the cultural side of, of the government. And so um, we are focused also on the cultural benefits that come from improving the supply chain. And I've touched a little bit on this. If we improve the supply chain, there's, there's less energy going into the, shift, the shifting around of books and information and more energy that can be put into cultural works, um, less to efficient processes and practices. The wasted time and effort on core supply chain practices can be spent on creating new cultural works, on promoting books, and putting more Canadian books into the hands of Canadian and international retailers. So again, why BookNet? Well, there was a desire from the industry and from government to see an improved supply chain. And we wanted to see that improved supply chain benefit all the players in the supply chain, be they big or small, that they be they established or emerging or foreign and domestic. So book networks across all of these different areas um, to try and make sure that all our stakeholders are seeing some benefit from supply chain improvements. And how do we go about that? Well, we coordinate uh, information uh, and we coordinate efforts. Um, we collaborate. We are a central clearinghouse of information and we are an honest broker. We sometimes jokingly refer ourselves to ourselves as the Switzerland of the publishing and book retail industry because we at, we work with just about anyone. Anyone that um, is doing good, we're interested in working with. So that's a really quick overview of BookNet. And once again, I'll, I'll touch on a lot of this other stuff as we walk through the presentation. But here's our, uh, our, our triangle, as we call it. These are the BNC products and services, and they all work together to build a foundation um, that helps improve the supply chain. So we offer both products and services, which I'm going to touch on a little bit. We also provide standards and certification, I'll touch on that, and research and education. And we think that all three of these product areas are fundamental to an improved supply chain. Um, we, we offer specific services, and some of those, which I'm going to touch on, um, are uh, EDI, which is electronic ordering, I'll touch on that one, bibliographic data and standards and certification, sales tracking, inventory analysis, and online catalogs, online catalogs and business to business tools. And we also provide research on technological change and market shifts to the Canadian industry. So I'm going to pick one of these to start with, and it's the one that we think is the foundation of everything we do and what everything that can be done to improve the supply chain, and that's standards. So standards <clears throat> lay a bedrock for our products and services, but they also, as I mentioned, help improve the supply chain, both here domestically and internationally. So what standards am I talking about in the book industry and, and in the book yeah. I'm talking about these things. So electronic ordering, bibliographic standards, subject schemes, which are subject standards, identifiers, and there are many others that book either directly involved in or tangentially involved in. So those could be GitHub, which is the ebook. Uh, standard GDSN, which is a global data network, or SANS, which are identifiers that denote shipping locations. There's lots of um, <clears throat> there's lots of standards that we're involved in because they help the industry. So we have active in Canada. We have active active committees that address bibliographic, EDI, and subject schemes. So what do we mean by active committees? They're committees that rep that represent our the cross sector of the industry and work to set um, standards in those particular subject areas based on the needs of the different stakeholders or actors in the supply chain. As well as working domestically, we work internationally. So we represent Canadian industries, <coughs> Canadian interests internationally, um, primarily <coughs> with a focus 
points in the U.S. supply chain because of the, as of the link I mentioned before between Canada and the U.S. Our supply chains are very, very linked together. Many books are shipped out of the U.S. to Canada, and a lot of Canadian publishers sell a lot of their books into the Canadian supply chain. So we make sure that the two markets are working very closely together. But we also work internationally, you know, primarily through Editura, which is the which is the standards organization that looks after Onyx and FEMA. So Onyx is the file format uh, that uh, we convey our metadata information in, in the book industry, and FEMA is one of our subject codes. So the reason why we spend time on the international committee, I've mentioned already, is that a lot of Canadian books, um, a lot of Canadian published and authored books are sold in the international markets. And standards makes those sales in international markets easier. It takes friction out of the supply chain again. And vice versa, there are international publishers and organizations selling their books into Canada um, that would like to make sure that they're doing it based on the needs of our supply chain. And so by working internationally with, with other organizations like BookNet and publishers and, and other actors in the supply chain, we can make sure that, once again, selling books cross borders is easier. Globalization writ large. So the, we work through committees, uh, primarily in advisory groups, and it's all about collaboration. So it isn't uh, just one actor saying that they need something. It's usually a, a wholehearted discussion about uh, the needs and requirements of different actors in the supply chain. And then we usually come to an agreement. So for instance, um, on the supply chain, uh, on the bibliographic data, we issue, in conjunction with the U.S., the best practices for product metadata for North America, which is built, which is takes into account the international standards as well. But this is a list of the data elements that uh, Canadian publishers should be providing to retailers to help for the sale of their books or help for the discovery of their books by consumers. And this is not something that uh, that BIFG or BookNet just pulled out of the air. It's something that uh, was agreed to over years and years of collaboration and discussion. We also set EDI standards. Um, this is an EDI document. If you've never seen one, this is an X12 document. These are the kinds of documents that uh, move order information around from retailer to publisher in North America primarily, uh, also in the world as well. This is for chips, not books, but uh, the idea is still the same. Um, we help set the standards for that for, for Canada and North America as well. And then we also work on, um, hopefully everyone knows what this is, this is a barcode representing uh, a 13 digit ISBN. Um, this is uh, one of the fundamentally important uh, standards that we use in our industry is the ISBN. Um, without it, uh, a lot of the stuff that we do um, that BookNet builds and offers uh, would be almost impossible. Um, and just as an example, when we run into retailers or publishers or other supply chain participants who don't know about the standards, or don't know about the ISBNs particularly, believe it or not, that still happens, um, in, the cost of engaging with those with those participants rises dramatically, and in some cases, it just it's almost impossible to do business with them. So, all of these standards are hugely important to how we do business, and again, taking cost out of out of the system. Um, there are a lot of other standards; those are just kind of the big ones, and I'm going to touch on some of them as we go through the products and services. So, with that, I'm going to jump into a few of the products and services that uh, we offer back to the industry uh, to help with their supply chain work. So. The first one I'm going to talk about is BiblioShare. So BiblioShare is uh, our data aggregation service. It aggregates bibliographic data for the Canadian market. It takes data in, checks its quality against those best, that best practices document I showed, and then makes it available to end users to pick up. We do this in almost all cases for free. So BiblioShare was born out of a, out of, out of a need of the industry to have an easy to use source of bibliographic data to drive projects. It was also born out of a need from BookNet to certify publishers on their data quality and provide a feedback loop to publishers on how well they're doing or not doing with the bibliographic data. So it started as a certification tool and then it grew up. And as it grew up, it started to add more and more functionality. So some of that functionality I've represented here. So publishers and distributors send us the bibliographic data in the form of Onyx primarily. We aggregate and quality control that data, provide information back to the publisher on the quality of their information based on rules that are set by the industry. We aggregate that information together, <clears throat> combine it with other metadata information we get, like images and price and availability. We use that data in our own products and services, but we also make it available to end users. 
um, websites, blogs, publishers, libraries, and retailers. Last year, we gave out almost 35 million uh, pieces of data on BiblioShare, um, all for free. So that's uh, people that are using our web services, which I'll touch on a little bit on. As I mentioned, we give back data quality report cards to publishers based on the quality of their data. Um, when comparing against the best practices, we do this for free, and every file gets quality control. So that the publishers get an immediate feedback on how well they're doing. They can fix their data and resubmit it, or they can just decide that uh, it's good enough and continue on. We always hope for this. And we'd like to see it fixed at the source. If it's fixed at, fixed at the source, and by that I mean if it's fixed at the publisher and we don't fix it, it means it's fixed at the publisher or the distributor. And whenever they send that data out to anyone else, it's fixed for them as well. So we're big advocates on fixing the data at the source. And you'll hear us say that quite a bit. So we provide feedback loops to allow publishers to understand what's changing. Um, we do allow some editing of data uh, inside BibliShare, but as I mentioned, we kind of tend to shy away from it. So we get all the data, we add the data together. We have over 2.5 million distinct titles or ISBNs in BibliShare. We have uh, post posting on 2 million cover images and other images, lots of pieces of information. And so we make that available in a bunch of different ways. We have plugins that are freely available for WordPress and Shopify. So the reason why we did that is having an aggregated data source allows um, someone like a, a book blogger uh, that's using WordPress to use our WordPress plugin to pull in bibliographic data directly into their blog without needing to rekey anything. So all they have to put in is the ISBN and it automatically pulls in the bibliographic data from BiblioShare and continually updates it. So if the publisher sends us a new cover image, it updates the, word, the WordPress blog or the blogger's blog without needing to do anything. And we have the exact same uh, kind of plugin for Shopify, which is an e-commerce tool, readily available, um, Canadian tool. And uh, we pull in bibliographic data from there so that publishers or retailers or other supply chain participants could build um, an online store quite quickly without needing to reach data. So those are both freely available. Um, the, web, the, web, the WordPress plugin uh, can be customized. It also can link to uh, local retailers or libraries, um, all just by putting an ISBN and, and tweaking things. And uh, you can embed that information directly into your blog <coughs> or, into a retail, or into a book blogger's blog. We also provide data to other industry initiatives. So 49 Shelf, which is a discovery platform for Canadian books, all of the metadata in that uh, platform comes from uh, BiblioShare and is provided uh, via our web services. So we also have over 10 uh, web services or open APIs that people can connect to to pull in data into their own projects. And we um, empower many, many new projects all the time with bibliographic data to help them discover and sale of books. We help drive some publishers' websites by including some metadata in uh, their websites uh, through our tools. Um, and we also uh, have our own tools for creating metadata. So um, this is the BiblioShare web form, which is a tool we provide to small publishers uh, and authors so that they can enter uh, their own metadata in the Onyx format. That data can be pushed directly into BiblioShare so that it's available to the supply chain for use in their projects. Or we will provide free of charge, or free of charge which is description, an Onyx file that they can take and ship off to Amazon or ship off to other um, supply chain participants. So you're not locked into the ecosystem at all. <clears throat> and the last video share I think, item I wanted to bring up, um, which is one of our newest ones, and it's free, so everyone likes that, is our bibliomatic uh, Chrome plugin. So the Chrome plugin, you can, if you're using Chrome, you can get from the Chrome app store. And what it does is it allows um, a lot of people are using Chrome to browse the, web, browse the web. Whenever Chrome sees an ISBN, it'll pop a little icon up next to the ISBN, and that little, ice, that little icon can be clicked on, and it'll, click, it'll display the metadata for that particular ISBN. And also, if you're a subscriber to BookNet products, it'll link to Sales Data Catalyst. And if the data is in, in BibliShare, possibly BibliShare, um, you can actually view the raw Onyx record. So not everyone's going to want to view raw Onyx record, record, but for those of us who work in the supply chain, that's a really handbook handy tool. So it's freely available. Um, you can go get it from the Chrome Web Store if you want, and then let us know how you're using it. Based on Catalyst, uh, a few years ago, we were, I'm sorry, based on Bitcoin Share, a few years, years ago, we released Catalyst. So what Catalyst is, is it's an e-catalog system that allows for the business-to-business -business communication and sale of um, and orders of books between uh, 
publishers, distributors, and the other side of the supply chain, which is retailers and libraries. So publishers build their catalogs in uh, Catalyst based on the data in Bibliosphere. Um, all they have to do is put in ISDMs and the bibliographic data is all pulled in automatically and populates their catalog. They can add extra information here. We can embed, um, as you can see up in the corner there, we can embed uh, e-dallies into the catalog so that uh, retailers and, and librarians can read the advanced reading copies if you have them. Um, we also have release calendars. We have a bunch of functionality in this catalog. We have now thousands of users across the Canadian supply chain using catalogs. Um, to communicate information and take orders from retailers and libraries back and forth. Um, we have a release calendar built off of Catalyst that uh, you can embed on the website. It's also available on the front page of Catalyst that will show the uh, newest books coming out based on different parameters. We also uh, allow um, the display of all kinds of information pulled in from, the, pulled in from BiblioShare. Um, that allows uh, for that more informed purchasing decision by booksellers and libraries and other supply chains. And this is all based on publisher metadata that's supplied through BiblioShare. They don't have to read key things or do layouts. We've also linked Catalyst to sales data so that retailers and, and publishers, but primarily retailers who are making purchasing decisions on books can see the history of comp titles, so the comparable titles. So in this case, um, if, there, if a sales rep was selling uh, this new uh, Elizabeth Salinger book into a retailer, uh, the retailer could see how the other books did at their store and why they crossed the market so they could make informed, more informed purchasing decisions. And you can see that down here, uh, from comparable titles. But we also so, show lots of other metadata about the actual title. So it allows, it's a tool that continues to grow to allow uh, more informed purchasing decisions and more informed supply chain. We've also recently launched a, as an add-on to Lone Star, sorry, an add-on to Catalyst is Lone Stars. So Lone Stars is our uh, discovery tool for uh, reader advisory groups by libraries. So librarians uh, can go on to Lone Stars, see which books are coming up over a certain, a certain amount of time, request advanced reading copies of those titles, read the advanced reading copies, and then come back to Catalyst and vote for those titles. Every month, BookNet takes those votes, aggregates them up, and releases uh, the recommended reading list by frontline librarians across Canada. It's an aggregated tool. And it's uh, to create discovery and awareness amongst patrons and book buyers. So um, the way that works is that uh, in Catalyst, you'll see there's a little vote button here if you're a librarian. The librarian can come in and click on that vote button on any title that's eligible. They can enter some information about that book. Um, we capture their little reviews if we want, and we use all of that as marketing collateral to push out the list. We push out the list to libraries, um, library wholesalers, and other supply chain participants. And this is primarily to aid, aid in discovery. And we also produce the posters and stickers that can go on books. Um, so back to data for a moment, uh, and then I'll jump back into some other products and services. So as I mentioned before, all of this data is very important to what we do in the supply chain. And really what we are primarily trying to do is fight ANIC data. And so what is ANIC data? ANIC data is um, data that doesn't, isn't really legitimate in effect. So it's data based on small sample sizes, survey based biases, vague data, data that is trying to draw correlations from or causations when they don't actually apply. And so what we want to do is give true, honest data that people can, so people can make an informed decision about what how the supply chain is working, how their businesses are working, so they can benchmark themselves, so they can see what's going on uh, globally across international and domestic markets. So what we're talking about is stuff like this. Like this is a small sample size sale. So I'm pretty sure that we have a designer here. He doesn't have red hair, so he maybe he's in the non-50%. But uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, weird assumptions made on the market based on data that's not really data. And so we're really trying to fight that. So with that, um, I want to jump into some actual data. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk primarily about the Canadian English market here. And I'm going to talk about the Canadian English market through our sales data tool. So our sales data tool um, has been around since about 2005. And uh, what it does is it tracks point of sale um, and inventory data across the marketplace in Canada, in English language market for print books. And so um, you may not have actually seen the product. Some people will have subscriptions, but some, but those of you who haven't seen the product, you may have seen something like this. So 
Um, we actually provide data that drives the best sellers in the Global Mail and the Toronto Star and other media outlets across the market. So you may not actually see the numbers there, but that best seller list is based on actual sales of books uh, to consumers across the market. So we're talking about numbers here. So what is sales data? Um, every week, sales data collects sales information from over 2,100 retail locations across Canada. It's a cross-section of the market, independents, chain stores, online retailers, newsstand, airport stores, mass market retailers, non-traditional retailers, library wholesalers, and others. And they all contribute data to BNC sales data by ISBN. So by ISBN every week, we get uh, the quantity sold in the previous week, how many books they have on hand at the end of the week, how many they have on order, and the average selling price. So the publishers can see exactly, and retailers can see exactly what's going on with the book up to a week, every a slice of dice on the market of a week. We represent about 85% of the Canadian print book sales market. We cover, we are tracking as of the end of last year, uh, 2.6 million ISBNs that have registered a sale in Canada over the 10 plus years that we've been running the service. In any given year, um, we track sales of about 500, 581,000 ISBNs. That number has continues to grow. Um, every year it's grown about 10%, or the last few years it's grown about 10%. So we track more and more ISBNs being sold in the print market, which is not even including ebook sales at this point. Um, we don't track ebook e -book sales and sales data. We'd like to, but uh, ebook retailers don't participate in sales data yet. Um, so while we're, while we're, while we're tra tracking more and more ISBNs, sales in the marketplace have actually gone down a bit over the last year, between 2015 and 2016, um, the value of the print book sales that we track went down about 3.7%. Um, that's actually better than some other years. Um, and uh, you know, there's lots of reasons why the market could be down a little bit. Um, and I'll touch on a few of those in a bit. Um, this is an updated graph uh, for uh, 2017. So this is showing the quarter, quarterly breakdown of unit sales for the last three years. So you can see our market has been pretty flat um, the last three years, just a little ups and downs. You'll see in Q4, off the very far side there, that obviously Q4 for this year is not done yet, so I don't have that data. The Q4 for 2015 is quite a bit higher <coughs> than 2016, and that's primarily because of coloring books. We saw a massive uh, flux, influx of coloring books and sales of coloring books in the fourth quarter of 2015 that we did not see in 2016, and I'm not expecting that we'll see in 2017. 2017 and 2016. Um, the market over uh, over the time period looks something like this. Uh, you may have seen me present this before. This is a year. So uh, the furthest to the x-axis there, that's the Christmas season. So you can see on a weekly basis or a monthly basis, we sell a lot of books at Christmas. So the Christmas market is almost three times the size of the market during other periods of the year. And those two lines just indicate the two years. So this is the U.S. market uh, from Nielsen MPD Nielsen Book Scan, and you can see it follows a similar, those peaks there are Christmas as well, um, and this is more quarters, it's going back all the way to 2010. And I popped on the, the digital book sales here too, so as you can see, um, the rise in digital may correlate uh, to, the, to the decrease in the physical books, and then you can see as over the last few years, we've seen a decrease in digital a little bit, and a little bit of a rise in, in physical. And so that, we've heard that across a lot of markets, and we've seen similar behavior in Canada. But I'm going to come back to this uh, digital print thing in a minute. So uh, the print market breaks down something like this. Um, it's changed over the last few years. We're seeing more and more juvenile sales uh, over the last few years than we have previously. So all this data is accessible through those people who have sales data subscriptions. If you don't, we make it available also um, in our yearly annual and a lot of our research. So you can get this research in our yearly annual from uh, our website. So just a little bit more on the Canadian market. Um, we also do uh, consumer and retail servicing, or surveying. So uh, just a little bit on, uh, on how Canadians read, since it's, a little, it's really important to the supply chain and how we sell them and get books out to retailers and uh, readers and buyers. So um, we ask uh, Canadians uh, how they spend their leisure time. <coughs> and you can see there that uh, we ask them to put two items, their top two items for how they spend their leisure time. And books comes in in fourth place. It's uh, been third or fourth for the last five or six years that we've been doing the survey. Um, browsing the internet has been first over that time. Um, but you can see 
you know, we're below some of those other other factors, but still well up there in how uh, consumers or how uh, readers spend their leisure time, which is a good thing. We've seen a slight decline in the number of books, uh, or sorry, the number of people who've read a book in the year, but it's not, uh, while that may have been a little bit of a concern, it's within the mar margin of error for this survey, and it's something we'll watch, but uh, it's just something to note that it's been a slight decline. And that's just in books. We're not talking about reading uh, just on the internet and things like that. We've seen similar behavior in the US. <clears throat> Last year, 84% of, of US of Americans said that they read a book in the previous year. Um, so it's about similar to Canada, and I think that's within their margin of error as well. Um, we do ask uh, if readers are going to be spending more time reading, and 38% of uh, our respondents say they'll actually spend more time reading or listening to books uh, this year than they were last year, and that's up 5% in our group. I'm going to skip formats and just come back to that in a minute. We also just released a new study about Canadians re reading Canadians. <coughs> so this is Canadians reading Canadian. Uh, subjects and authors, and this study is freely available on the internet uh, on our website. So 44% uh, of book buying Canadians read a book by Canadian author in the last year. That's up from 24% in 2012, the last time we did that, so that's a significant increase. And some of that can probably be chalked up to the awareness of Canada this year uh, because of our uh, 150th birthday, um, and also because <laughs> there were some big name Canadian authors that had a lot of activity. And those authors, and that author, it's primarily Margaret Atwood. So um, we ask Canadians that they can, we ask Canadian book readers and book buyers that they can uh, identify a Canadian author. Um, and it was up this year, it was down from 32% in 2012. So 32% of people in 2012 could not identify a Canadian author. This year it was only 20%. And the author they could most identify with was the Margaret Atwood, Margaret Atwood, the one they could most identify with Margaret Atwood. We also uh, survey consumers on their buying habits. And this is how we find out about uh, format breakdown. As I mentioned earlier, we don't chart the sale of ebooks at the title level like we do print books uh, for a lot of different reasons. But we still do consumer surveying every quarter about uh, how the, what books they're purchasing, and we do that at the ISBN level. So while this is not a perfect way to, to measure the, 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 the size of the marketplace in different ways, it's a pretty accurate, accurate way, and we do validate these numbers against publishers. So what we see here, what you're seeing here is that each of these lines represents a different format. Um, each dot is a, a different quarter for the last uh, seven quarters. Uh, this is updated just as of uh, September. So we saw ebooks uh, go from about 20% of the marketplace in Canada, go down to about 15% of the marketplace in Canada in uh, about a year ago. And now we've actually seen over the last four quarters a slight rise in the ebooks again. Uh, as a percentage of all the books being bought. So this is something we'll continue to monitor. It's interesting because uh, we, you know, we did see it going down and now we're seeing it start to go back up. So we want to know why that is the case. And so we'll watch that. We're seeing somewhat similar behavior in other markets. So again, this is for Nielsen MPD book scan. And what we saw there mimics what we saw in Canada over the last while in that we actually, over the last two years, saw a decrease in ebook sales up till this year where we've seen them kind of bounce back. And so, a lot of this we think is based on price, uh, the differential between price, the print book and ebook price. When the differential is high, <coughs> people um, tend to go tend to go a little bit more with the ebook, and so the percentage rises. When the ebook price and the print book price are close to one another, as they are for lots of reasons right now, um, we see people tend to gravitate more to the print book. So that's uh, that's why we're seeing this kind of rise and, and lower. We also look at channel breakdown. Um, of sales. So 52% of all the sales we've charted uh, last year in 2016 were made in store and 48% were made online. And when you break it down by actual channel and up to, the, uh, up to September of this year, it looks something like this. So um, we consider online to be on, the on physical or sorry, online on Amazon, Indigo. Um, but if you add in uh, online ebook, audio, and mobile app, we're, we're at about 48%. So the market's almost evenly split between where consumers are making their purchases physical, in-store, or online, and that could be for digital or it could be for print books. And so that's, uh, that's a big shift in our marketplace, so that really affects the supply chain as well. Um, in the U.S. market, uh, it's even more online heavy, uh, and this is from uh, Data Guy, and he did an analysis last year on U.S. Uh, fiction books sales, and you can see, based on the data he has, that 
77% of all adult fiction books were bought online in the US. So that's across all formats, but that's a huge shift in the marketplace. And so, you know, there's, you know, we're doing a lot of things to manage those things. So we have lots of this data uh, available in our genre studies um, across, the, across the marketplace. So these studies analyze individual subject categories and pull in uh, sales data from our sales data product, bibliographic data from BiblioShare, and they pull in uh, consumer research data for each of these subject matters, subject uh, areas, to help uh, retailers and publishers manage, manage their behavior in the supply chain. And so if you're a sales data subscriber, you can get these for free off the sales data website. If you're not a sales data subscriber, you can buy them for 25 bucks each, or you can buy a subscription to all of them for $100, which is great value, and they continue to come out all the time. So the one project uh, that I just kind of want to touch on near the end here, very quickly, because we're almost out of time, is uh, the EDI project. I didn't spend a lot of time on this because there's not a lot to see, but this is a hugely important project in the supply chain, and um, it's what we would consider the plumbing of the industry. So, and just a refresh on what EDI, EDI is. It stands for Electronic Data Interchange, and it's the transfer of data from one computer system to another by a standardized message format. Um, without the need of human intervention. So EDI permits multiple companies, possibly in different company, countries, to exchange documents electronically. And what does that mean for the Canadian industry? Well, that means that retailers can completely in automated ways place purchase orders with suppliers, be they publishers or distributors, um, and those publishers and suppliers can send back information to the retailer almost instantaneously in some cases, or very quickly in other cases, back to the retailer, and the two systems, and it doesn't need to be any human intervention on both sides. So this is a huge supply chain boom. And um, so just these documents, the 850 is the purchase order, and that goes from the retailer to the supplier, and then right, almost right away, the supplier sends back to the retailer a purchase order acknowledgement that says, we have these books in stock, here's how much they cost. Um, we don't have them in stock, here's where you can get them from, they can say that as funny information. Or, it's been replaced by a different edition, all that information, and that can all be done computer to computer with no intervention. <clears throat> and then when the books are ready to be shipped, a supplier can tell the retailer ahead of time, we're shipping the books now, here's when they could arrive at your store, here's what's in each box, and, there, and there's a, usually a label on the box that can be scanned that pulls off exactly the invoice, and then the invoice can go back. So this is called EDI order cycle, and this is used extensively in the Canadian marketplace and other marketplaces. Um, and it's based completely on standards. There are other EDI documents that are being traded between retailers and suppliers, and there are a lot. So it's, this is bedrock stuff. And in Canada, last year, there was 3 million documents traded back and forth between retailers and suppliers, almost with no human intervention. Of those 3 million docu documents, three quarters of a million of those documents were just purchase orders. So that's a lot of information going back and forth. And this is a project near and dear to my heart because uh, I was a bookseller once upon a time and uh, it was before EDI was prevalent in our industry and uh, I used to have to call in all my orders to uh, books uh, into suppliers. So I'd have to call in, read out the ISBN and then the quantity and they'd have to read it back and that took me a vast amount of time and now that's almost all completely automated. So this is one of our, one of our as the industry success stories and, and EDI is used in other markets as well to different degrees but uh, it really, really helps the supply chain. So with that, I just want to jump back to our triangle again. So before I move on to, to questions, I hope I've covered off some of the supply chains. That was a lot of information very quickly. I know this is going to be recorded, and we'll make it available as well as make the slides available. But before I move on to questions, there's an area that I didn't touch on very much, and that was education. We do a lot of things uh, to help educate the marketplace stakeholders in Canada. So we do webinars, just like this one. Um, they're often mentioned on our website and in our emails. We release, we release white papers on different aspects of the market, many of them for free. We do lecturing at uh, higher ed publishing programs, at uh, trade shows, anywhere, anywhere that we can. Um, we also have our own conferences um, and lecture at other conferences. So um, our large conference, and you're all invited, um, if you're not already coming, is uh, here in Toronto in March. Um, it's a two-part conference. Uh, on the first two days, March 21st and 22nd, we have a, a conference de dedicated to the production and sale and effect, but mostly the production of ebooks or digital books. And then on the 23rd, 
We have large our tech forum. So this looks at technology and impact and, and innovation in the book industry supply chain. And we've been running now for um, 12 or almost 12 years. And uh, it's a great program. Um, and tickets are on sale now. You can get them off our website or go to techforum.booknetcanada.ca. And we've been releasing uh, information uh, about that conference as we go. So with that, uh, very quickly, I'm, gonna, I'm wrapping it up. Um, I think we have some time for questions, so I'm going to pass it back to Zelina. Um, thanks very much, everyone. And uh, I hope you got something useful out of this presentation. So we had one question from the research section on the uh, the consumer purchase by format graph that you showed. Um, if the looking for clarification on what mass on what the uh, other category means and if it means mass market. Um, the other here is usually things like <coughs> ebook apps or uh, other digital book formats that people have put in. Um, or sometimes there's just some leather bound stuff that falls in there that doesn't really fall under the hardcover or paperback category or calendars. We try and filter a lot of that out. Some of that falls into the other category. <laughs> so other in the truest sense. Yeah. yeah for sure. uh, so we have another question. Um, are there any issues you've encountered with standardization of information or data? Yes. <laughs> That's a very good question. So <clears throat> there's always uh, problems with standardization and, uh, and and massaging of data, I guess. So, as I mentioned, you know, as the as the supply chain gets more, uh, I'm using I'm putting air quotes, people can't see me, but I'm putting air quotes around the world word muddy. But as we have more and different players in the supply chain, um, then then the traditional kind of bookseller, supplier, publisher relationships, um, we get people who don't uh, we get actors in the supply chain who don't have the focus on books and book standards like we traditionally have. So some of the big retailers, um, you know, Google, for instance, is selling books, but it's not a massive focus of theirs. And so um, for them to invest the money in, in adopting standards is sometimes uh, the ROI for them is not, uh, is not there. And so that, that presents a challenge for the industry, for everyone in the industry. And what we really want to do is, is get everyone using the standards that we can. But because of the way the, the, the market's changing or the uh, supply chain is changing, that's getting a little harder and harder. So, um, you know, we work through BookNet and BISG and Editor and BIC in the UK and other organizations to just make the ROI for adopting standards better and better all the time. And so we do see some movement there. So that, that's definitely one of the challenges is the new players in the, in the industry. And also, I think just time. It takes time to implement these things, and it takes it takes someone who really wants to make the changes to sit down and actually think, think it through. And so, you know, there are other organizations I mentioned some of them that help with that, but there is it does take some work. So it's not it's not always the easiest thing. And so, um, you know, it, it, it takes time. And we're all busy, and we're managing these multiple supply chains, and uh, there's a lot going on. So I, I think time. ROI, those are some of our, our biggest challenges. And then, you know, we would always like the standardization to happen, as I mentioned, like correcting bibliographic data. We would like to ha have it happen as close to the source as it can. So that may be in the side of a publisher, it may be standardizing using Onyx or Sigma and making fixes and continually improving their data. Or on the retailer side, it may be using the ISBN. We still have lots of retailers. Um, so there's especially in the non-traditional book retailers who don't use ISDNs to register sales or link in metadata, and that makes doing stuff with them very, very difficult. So we'd always like those that the standardization to be adopted as far, far upstream or as we possibly can. Uh, so we have a actually very good question um, about whether or not we collect data on reading trends in public libraries as opposed to just retail trends. Um, we do. Um, it depends on exactly what is meant by by reading trends. So we uh, we do get some in our consumer panel data. We get some reader patron data. So we ask about usage of the library in a lot of different ways, and we release some of that. We'll continue to release some of that data onto our e news newsletter and on the blog. But that's mostly focused on how book buyers are using libraries, not necessarily how readers are becoming book buyers. We do ask also in our leisure study, which we tend to release at Tech Forum each year, um, about uh, some library behavior. 
um, when it comes to reading books. So are they purchasing them? Are they getting, from, uh, getting them from uh, libraries? And then <clears throat> we are working on a new initiative uh, that we hope to have some data available next year, um, where we, like we do for uh, sales data, where we, where we capture point of sale information um, from the register at a bookstore by ISBN, we are looking to capture and aggregate uh, circulation data from libraries. So that'll be how many uh, checkouts they have by ISBN and how many holds are on those ISBNs, and we will make that available back to the uh, marketplace to use, both publishers and libraries, but also we'll be able to do research on it, so we'll get a nice, good idea of, of how the, those books are circulating and how that may have an impact on sales or how it may correlate or with sales as well. Uh, so, quick question about how Goodreads and Amazon fit in. So maybe we can touch on um, where some of the sales come in? Yeah, certainly. So Goodreads is a discovery platform uh, primarily, and it's owned by Amazon. Um, so they they don't make sales primarily. They link to Amazon to make their sales. So, um, But it is an important discovery platform, and uh, we've released, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but we, we, when we ask book buyers where are they how they discovered the book that they bought, um, how they became aware of a book. Goodreads definitely rates as an important uh, discovery channel for all book sales, or for many book sales. So that's the that's the Goodreads side, and uh, you know we don't work with them uh, on sales, but we do get some Amazon sales. We'd like to get more, um, so we do get some sales reporting from Amazon um, on what they're selling in the Canadian market. We don't get any other international sales, unfortunately. 